Hello, I'm Solomon Seranja. Welcome to Focus on Africa. Our top stories. Rescue operations are continuing overnight in Nairobi after a residential building collapsed early on Friday. At least four people have died, with many more still trapped inside. We're trying to call my nephew, and he's not picking up. And up until now, we don't know where he is. A judge in London dismisses the war crime trial of ex-wife of former Liberian president for lack of evidence. What does Liberia make of this? Our position has always been that any Liberian citizen who is accused of uh, such serious crimes as torture you know, should be granted the, the, a fair legal process. Also in the program, Taking Back Control. We visit the teaching project in Tanzania, helping teenage mothers shunned by their families to get back on track. And in sport, in part two of our interview with Nigerian international Leo Balgun, he speaks to Mimi about his uncertain future with club and country. Thank you for joining us. I have the pleasure of presenting from London today as the winner of the BBC Komla Dumois Award. At least four people have died and many others have been rescued from the rubble of a building which collapsed in Kenya's capital Nairobi on Friday morning. Rescue workers say that they can still hear voices under the slabs of the fallen concrete. Ferdinand Omondi has been on site and sent this report for us. <laughs> More than eight hours since this building collapsed, rescue operations are still underway. For the period that I have been here, there have been at least five people rescued alive and with varied injuries, and they've all been rushed for emergency medical treatment in the nearest hospitals. But I've also seen a body bag or two. Authorities have described this as a residential house, six floors which had at least 57 occupied rooms. It is not clear how many people were in there. We're trying to call my nephew and he's not picking up. And up until now, we don't know where he is. This area is largely low income and the structures put here, which are the residential flats, even to the naked eye, do not look well properly planned and structured. I've spoken to the authorities about this incident because it is not the first time it has occurred. There have been some in recent past similar structures just crumbling down and claiming many lives. And the authorities say that they've been trying to do something about it. We have had to remove even other people by force in buildings which the national building in fact inspected it found it to be unsafe and they are still continuing that inventory so that we can begin taking action before further further disaster it's been a tough few days for kenya with the heavy rains pounding the region causing massive destruction of property and the death of at least 100 people it's too early to tell whether the rains had anything to do with this However, rescue operations are likely to proceed into Saturday and those trapped inside will be hoping to get out alive. The BBC's Ferdinand Domodi now joins us live from our Nairobi studios. Ferdinand, what is the latest and what kind of support are the families getting? Well, now concerns are not getting higher, especially since it's been more than 12 hours since the building collapsed and there are still voices being heard and operations going on and more than 30 cannot be accounted for. A rescue tent has been put where people can go and write their registration, some sort of help center and counseling for those people there as they try and get more information about the people who could be missing. But it is now confirmed that this could actually go well into tonight and into tomorrow. And as time rounds out for those who are in there, hopes remain very, very high, though there are those who also feel that it's getting slimmer as they could be running out, running out of oxygen by now. Ferdinand Domoni, live for us from Nairobi. Thank you, Ferdinand. Now joining us live from Kampala is Dr. Julius Mulumba, a structure engineer. Thank you so much for joining us. Now across the continent, buildings have been collapsing from Nigeria to Uganda. Is it just about the poor construction works or are there any other causes? There are a number of reasons why uh, buildings in this part of the world are collapsing. 
But uh, the main ones are majorly incorrect structural designs. Uh, designs which are entrusted to people who are not uh, are qualified to design. The second reason is actually a result of poor construction methods on the side of the contractors. And thirdly, it is mainly a sheer uh, incompetence or, or corruption on these construction sites. Dr. Mulumba, let's talk about standards. Are there some good examples in Africa that can be emulated where standards are taken very seriously? Exactly. Uh, for example, uh, in Southern Africa, in South Africa, the standards there are very much enforced. Now, in some areas, you find that the standards are there, but the law enforcement is not up to standard. And the people actually go out of their way and start construction without actually following the designs. So that is very critical. What is the one thing that anyone who wants to rent a house, what, what should they look for? First of all, they must ensure that the building they want to rent has been properly approved by the municipal authorities. Uh, they should look at the plans, the structural plans, and then if uh, uh, there is any queries they have, they can actually consult the municipalities so they can tell them whether those structural designs were approved by authorities. Short of that, they run uh, a risk of entering buildings which were not approved in the first place. Dr. Julius Mulumba joining us live from Kampala. Thank you so much for speaking to us. Well, let's look at other stories making headlines across the African continent and the rest of the world. Nigeria's journalist and activist Omoela Shaori has been rearrested at the court hearing less than 18 hours after he was freed by authorities on bail. The former presidential candidate has been in detention since his arrest in August. He's facing charges of treason, money laundering and cyber stalking. Kenya's authorities have arrested the governor of Nairobi County, Mike Sonko, on suspicion of involving in a multi-million dollar corruption scandal. He's accused of money laundering and unlawful acquisition of public property. He denies the allegations and describes it as a witch hunt carried out for political reasons. And in India, four men who had been arrested, who had been accused of the rape and murder of a vet have been shot dead by police. Officers say they had taken the captured men to the scene of crime for reconstruction and they killed the suspects when they tried to seize their weapons. The rape case have caused outrage across the country. A judge in London has cut short the war crimes trial of Agnes Reeves Taylor, the ex-wife of the former Liberian President Charles Taylor, for lack of evidence. She was charged in 2017 of a string of offences, including torture, during the bloody civil war. She faced, eight year, she, she faced eight charges that included conspiracy to commit torture by allegedly facilitating the rape of captive women by soldiers in Charles Taylor's forces. Three of the torture allegations related to assault on a 13-year-old boy. Up to 250,000 people are believed to have been killed during the civil conflict between 1989 and 2003. Well, uh, Dr. Dr. Reeves Taylor denied wrongdoing and is due to stand in trial. Well, I'm now joined by BBC's Home Affairs correspondent, Dominic Catherine. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Solomon. Well, well, what happened in court today? This was a very unusual development in this case, Solomon. It's been going on since June 2017 after yeah. Scotland Yard here in London charged Dr. Reeves Taylor on evidence uh, which had been gathered in Liberia by two NGOs, two war crimes investigatory charities. And the evidence amounted to eight counts of torture and conspiracy to torture. One of the most serious of those allegations revealed in court was that uh, Dr. Agnes Reeves Taylor allegedly personally uh, shot dead two children. The case was, however, stopped today before, just before the trial was due to get underway in the new year because of a complication around the British law of torture. Yeah. And in essence, what the senior judge said today was that in the area where the crimes happened, Nimba County in Liberia, there was no clear evidence that Charles Taylor's troops were in control in 1990 when Dr. Reeves Taylor, her, yeah. his then wife, was alleged to have carried out these crimes. And therefore, under British law, the case had to stop. Now, unusually, 
That means she's neither innocent nor guilty. The case has simply come to a stop. How difficult is this to prosecute such cases which have taken quite a while and to collect evidence? It's, it's clearly a very, very difficult job to do. So in this particular case, Scotland Yard in London were first made aware of these allegations against uh, Dr. Reeves Taylor in 2014. She'd been living legally in the UK and was working as a lecturer. She was charged in 2017. This isn't the first such complicated war crimes related trial to fall apart in the UK and certainly Civitas Maxima, one of the campaign groups involved in this case, they say that survivors of torture have been denied a day in court to air their stories before a British jury and they say at the moment days in court before a British jury may be the only way that some of these stories will ever get heard. Also, uh, just a quick one, Take, talk to us. So the judge has also said that she cannot stay in the UK anymore. This is a bit of a complicated one. So Dr. Dr. Reeves Taylor claimed asylum and she won that on appeal. So she was allowed to stay. At the moment, she hasn't been given permission to stay permanently because the Home Office, that's our interior minister here in London, says that it has concerns about her past and believes she may be she may be connected to the war crimes. So that's clearly unproven because she denies that. Yep. But that's possibly going to appeal. But like I say, she denies this. And tonight she says she wants to get home to her family. Dominique Cassin, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us. Earlier I spoke to Liberia's Information Minister Eugene Nagbe and asked him for what government's reaction was on the dismissal of the war crime charges for Mr. Taylor. Well, our government was not a party to that legal process. We have heard over the international wire that she has been, uh, she's going to be released. Uh, our position has always been that any Liberian citizen who is accused of uh, such serious crimes as torture, you know, should be granted the, the a fair legal process. Well, speaking of justice, the British courts have actually denied her for the asylum application. That means she may be coming home. If she comes to Liberia, will you open up a case against her? The government will not do isolated uh, uh, judicial process regarding the crimes that happened during the war or the allegations of crimes by individuals. President Weir has submitted a request to the national legislature, our parliament, to define the parameters for the establishment of a war crimes court in Liberia. And that is currently a national topical issue. It is under discussion in parliament and we will have some finality uh, by next year. Let's talk about, uh, let's shift some gears and talk about the money that was missing. About 15.5, you know, million, uh, Liber billion yeah. Liberian dollars. Quite a lot of money. And even after the investigations by the presidential investigative team, there were no conclusive uh, findings. So where is the money? Firstly, we launched an investigation on two tracks. We hired, with support from the U.S. government, we hired a firm, an independent firm, Crawl Associates. They came and did an investigation. It was conclusive because they discovered that, unlike all that has been broadcast in the international press and local press, the 16 billion was in missing. It was taken to the Central Bank of Liberia and accounted for and lodged at the Central Bank of Liberia. 2.6 billion of that money just disappeared, but, you know, but, which is according to the same report that you're quoting. This, this is why we have currently in court the former governor of the Central Bank of Liberia, his deputy and other senior officials of the Central Bank of Liberia to account for the portion of the monies that were not accounted for based on the reports that came about after these investigations. And they, there is an ongoing legal process now uh, because of that aspect. But to say that the entire $16 billion that were printed got business is just not the case. And yet President George Ware is actually pushing Parliament to seek approval to print extra money, billions of Liberian dollars. Yes, that is the Liberian constitutional requirement. You know, when there is a need for the injection of, of, of a new currency or new banknotes in the market, we have to make our case as a government to the Parliament, that is our national legislature. So the president is only following the law because we've determined that there is a requirement for us to print additional bank notes. 
This is Focus on Africa from the BBC World News with me, Solomon Serwanja. Still to come. It's a big heavyweight title rematch that many will be watching. And body weight is the big talk pointing ahead. I'm Solomon Serwanja. You're watching Focus on Africa, the top stories on this program. Four people have died and many more were feared trapped after a residential building collapsed in the Kenyan capital, Nairobi. The war crimes trial in Britain of Liberia's former first lady has collapsed for technical reasons. You're watching BBC Focus on Africa. It's time for sport. Mimi. Thank you very much, Solomon. Now, we continue today with more from my sit-down interview with Nigeria international Leon Balogu. He struggled to get much playing time with his club and country lately. He's staying positive with the aim to get more minutes with his English Premier League club Brighton and Hove Albion rather than being on the sidelines. But it's his place in the Nigeria squad that is really close to his heart as he's hoped to get back into the fold. I went to meet him in Brighton and he began by telling me how disappointed he was. The way it happened was a bit disappointing because no one spoke to me before and I have respect for all of them and I respect that I haven't been playing in my club and it's a competitive sport so that's to your question I understand yes but I think it's a matter of kind of respect and how you deal with someone. I've been a regular for five years in that team. It was a bit disappointing I mean I got injured one day before the match so the frustrating part didn't kick in actually but then i think I, I just would have wished for like a bit of more communication about it from gernot roy the coach yeah probably because i mean i spoke to him about it as well it was just like i didn't see that coming and hands up to shimmy he's been doing fantastic in his club last season and this season and i was even one of the ones who told him like after the afcon your time will come I just didn't know <laughs> that would happen so soon in that way. No, but this is no like no how feelings against Shimi. I really like him. But was he disappointed by his performance in the Madagascar game at the Africa Cup of Nations? It would be sad for me to end my international career like that, you know. That would be really, really sad. Like with the last game being Madagascar. Yes. That didn't end up too well, you know. It's like you had a lot of criticism. Uh, yeah, I know. And I think there was way more actually to be happy about than to criticize me um, before that match, you know, in all the years. And I would like to remember, I would like to be remembered by Nigerians as what I've always been for them, you know, with this one exception. You've had a lack of minutes playing for your club, Brighton. Are you looking to play regular football come to January transfer window? As much as January might be an option for me for change, um, I like to focus more on what I can change right now. And I will do everything that is in my power and that is then everything I can do. The rest is up to the club, to the manager. And if he decides to give me a chance, I will take it with great gratitude and I will try to make the most out of it. And yeah, let's see, well, I'll take it from there. Best of luck to him. The second round of group games in the African Champions League is underway. There are three fixtures and in just a few minutes left for AS Vita Club of DR Congo who are at home to Raja Casablanca. Raja Casablanca a leading 1-0 in that game with four former champions in it including the holders Esperance who hosts Jess Kabile of Algeria later in the group. They both won their opening games. The other game sees Al Ahli of Egypt take on Al Hilal Omdurman of Sudan. A defending world champion. Now, many Nigerian boxing fans will be keeping a close eye on the Anthony Joshua and Andy Ruiz Jr. heavyweight title rematch on Saturday. Remember, Joshua's parents are from Nigeria. Their weigh-in was held today in Saudi Arabia. Anthony Joshua coming in three stones lighter than Ruiz, whose speed got the better of his opponent earlier this year. Ruiz is just over a stone heavier. 
Now, the crisis in South African cricket has deepened today. Cricket South Africa says it has suspended its chief executive, Tabang Moray, following allegations of misconduct. There has not yet been any comment from Moray himself. In a further blow, the CSA's major sponsor, Standard Bank, announced it will not renew its contract with Cricket South Africa when it ends in April 2020. That's all the sports, Solomon. Well, Mimi, I'm looking forward to that much. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> Thank you, Mimi. All right. Being a new mom is difficult enough. But in Tanzania, if you are a teenage mother, it means you cannot, allow, you cannot always go back to school or may even be shunned by your family. But in the northern eastern part of the country, a center is offering hope and education to some of these young women. BBC's Abu Bakr Famu went to meet up with the first group of women who graduated. Clad in her newly made dress, happy and optimistic of her future. Deborah Emanuel, a 20-year-old mother of twins, is graduating from a skills class, which she sees as the beginning of her new life. After all, she had dropped out of school after becoming pregnant three years ago and was thrown out of the house by her family. I am proud because I'm taking this course of cookery because it will help me go out and cook. I'm also proud of this college because we will have some money to start business. This professional skills center located outside the city of Arusha in northeastern Tanzania teaches skills such as cooking, tailoring and hairdressing, provides support to teenage mothers who had become excluded by their families or forced to drop out of school after becoming pregnant. Meanwhile, their children are being taken care of at a daycare facility located in the same compound. This is much needed, especially after Tanzania's President John Magufuli banned teenage mothers from returning to public schools in June 2017, saying that they would be a bad influence to the rest. But it's not easy. This initiative is a brainchild of a 72-year-old retired teacher, Martina Simon Sierra, who founded Faraja Center with the support of some donors. I'm sure there is need to review the government's directive and also do a critical research to analyze the situation, see if the graph has gone up or down. I absolutely agree with the government, but let's look at the impact now and see. The work of this center has now spread far to other parts of the country, but much more needs to be done to give hope to so many girls in this country who become pregnant while at school and have no one to turn to for help. Well, BBC's Abu Bekar Famao reporting there. Well, before we go, I just want to bring you this remarkable story about a British woman who was revived by Spanish doctors after her heart stopped beating for six hours. And surprisingly, she described her survival as miraculous. 34-year-old Audrey Schumann developed severe hypothermia and felt unconscious when she was hiking through a snowstorm on a Spanish mountain in November. According to Dr. Eduardo Agudo, who helped to save her life, it was the low temperatures of hypothermia which protected her body and brains from deteriorating while unconscious. Her husband, Rohana, said he had feared the worst. I thought she was dead because um, I was I was trying to feel for a pulse, trying to feel for my fingers were also numb, so I wasn't sure if it was my fingers, but I couldn't feel a breath, I couldn't feel a heartbeat or anything. Probably this winter I won't go to the mountains, but I hope that in spring we will be able to start hiking and trekking again. Um, I don't I don't want this to uh, to take away that hobby from me. Well, don't forget you can get in touch with me and some of the teams on social media. My name is Solomon Seraja. It's been quite a very good experience for me. From the entire team, enjoy the rest of your viewing.